Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Kush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. It's a pleasure to be with you here at the Pakistan Society of Rheumatology, especially on this Silver Jubilee event. I've been asked today to talk about my favorite subject in rheumatology. I hope it will soon be yours, and that is, of course, adult onset stills disease. Let's get started. So um, stills disease is a, a challenge for many of us. We um, see patients who are presenting with fever. They're often quite ill. And the question is, how do you diagnose this? Um, what are the considerations in diagnosis and how to move forward with regard to um, new therapies? So these are my conflicts or um, some of the potential conflicts. Uh, my only reasonable one here is I have a consultant to Novartis who has an FDA approved product for Stills disease in the United States, that's canakinumab. This is the first case of Stills disease I saw as an internal medicine resident in 1984. A 23-year-old gal presented with a three-week history of fever, um, sore throat, she was having diarrhea, abdominal pain, arthralgias, and you can see these are her the fevers uh, spikes that she had during the first two weeks. As high as 105, it was associated with high set rate, high CRP, high white counts, ranging from 20 to 40,000. Uh, obviously, after exclusion of other etiologies, uh, this wasn't a hard diagnosis, even back then in 1984. And I'll remind you, the condition really only had been described in 1971. The question is, how do we make the diagnosis? So that's a question to you. Can you make a diagnosis of Stills disease with a test? Can you confirm it with a test? I left out the word test on this question. And the answer, of course, that you have to choose from is yes or no, true or false. And the answer is false. There is no confirmatory test that one can order to diagnose this condition. I wanna confirm that. There is no diagnostic test. Stills disease is a systemic inflammatory disorder. It's a syndrome. And as it does not have a clear etiology or diagnostic test or pathology, uh, it is therefore a syndrome that you make after considering the presentation and excluding some other conditions. It's typically, as you know, a juvenile disorder, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, SOJA or SJIA. But when it continues beyond age 16, up to age 35, you should consider something like adult stills disease. It's some key symptoms are quotidian fevers, evanescent rashes, polyarthritis, a sore throat that's prodromal, meaning it happens at the onset, serositis, organomegaly, high white counts, and a very aggressive, very marked uh, elevations of set rate CRP and other acute phase reactants, of which ferritin is only one. So in some, this is a di diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, the disease itself <clears throat> has a systemic onset and then it can go into remission and then have systemic recurrence. We could call that a polysystemic or polycyclic systemic, but some patients will develop um, the onset of systemic disease followed by chronic inflammatory arthritis. Either way, this condition can give you long disease-free intervals. The longest one I've ever seen is 40 years. The patient I just showed you, the 23-year-old, she was sick from ages 9 to 12 with an undiagnosed febrile illness, which in retrospect was systemic JIA. So she had an 11-year disease-free interval before the disease came on out of the blue quite suddenly. If you consider systemic JIA and the adult continuation of the disease, adult stills disease or adult onset stills disease, all the manifestations are exactly the same. There's probably only one and that is the prodromal sore throat, which is part and parcel of the adult presentation, 70%, but is uncommon in kids. And the reasons for that are not entirely clear. It's also not entirely clear what that sore throat is. Is it an initial infection that might have been the activator of the inflammasome and an aggressive NLRP3 response with lots of IL-1, IL-18? Or is it just a manifestation of lymphoid hyperplasia reactivation? And that's what gives you the sore throat from lymph node tissues. And there's evidence of that too. We really don't know. This is a long history. And 
The condition bears the name of George F. Still, who in 1897 described 22 children who had a form of chronic arthritis, uh, a subset of whom had uh, systemic features like weight loss, lymphadenopathy, anemia. They did not describe the high fevers. They did not describe the rash, which is sometimes called the Stills rash. That was described by Boldero and colleagues in 1933. Otto Multi actually was the first to describe Stills disease in the adult in the Scandinavian literature in the same year. But over the years, this disease has been around. It just called different things or not called the right thing. The French literature called this the Whistler Fanconi syndrome or subsepsis hyperallergica. It wasn't until these two key seminal papers in 71 and 73 by Eric Bywaters at Hammersmith in the UK and Joseph Bujak at the NIH described 14 and 10 patients, female and male respectively, that really classify this disease incredibly well. And I want to stress that to you that those two papers are probably all you need to read if you want to understand Stills disease. So the original Bywaters paper, 1971, Annals of Rheumatic Disease, the paper by Bujak was a, a series that published in the journal Medicine. If you look at these two reports, and by the way, they're not like current reports. These are very descriptive case reports. So it's like you know, 10, 12, 18 pages, something like that to read through the cases, but that's how you really get to understand this condition. Early on, the Bywaters report, it was all females. Later on, Bujak was all males. It turns out it's equal between the sexes as to who gets affected, both in kids and adults. Again, this is the adult continuum of the juvenile disorder, hence it's less common in adults than it is in children, but yet it behaves the same. Once you start making this diagnosis after age 35 or after age 50, you're on your own, it's probably not going to fit. You must have, a, and a subset of these people actually have a prior history of systemic JIA, as did my patient that I presented at the outset. You must have the, the, the triad here, the quotidian fevers, the rash that comes and goes, the polyarthritis. That's almost required for the diagnosis for you to seriously consider this diagnosis. Many of you make this diagnosis because you have an undiagnosed fever, some systemic manifestations in your rheumatologist. Well, that would be the wrong thing to do, right? You need to actually meet criteria, which requires these three. Other features I've already mentioned to you, and they were prominent in these two case reports. This is the fever that, that was in the Bywaters paper. It's spiky, it's up and down. It returns to baseline, meaning below 99 every day. That is what is the definition of a quotidian fever is. This is a very common disorder. If you work in a major medical center, you're going to see one or two of these a year. Um, based on the epidemiology, what we know, the incidence rate is about one case per 100,000. And in my city of Dallas, Texas, we can expect to see almost 19 to 20 cases per year um, with Stills disease. Yet, even though I'm like the self-declared world's expert in Stills disease, I don't see 19 cases a year, and I should be. Um, they kind of end up in a lot of different places and maybe not in your hands until it's too late. As you can see, as I said earlier, this is the adult continuation of the juvenile disorder. So mostly in the 20s, some in the 25s, 30s, a few in the 30s. After age 35, um, you see very few cases. After age 50, 9% of cases um, were going to have Stills disease. Now, more recently, many, many people are starting to make this diagnosis in the elderly. I guarantee you they're incorrect diagnoses. They're not based on criteria. They really have no long-term follow-up. I think this, these are very uh, rational, reasonable numbers. 75% of cases will have their onset before the age of 35. So again, I can't stress enough the, the triad. Fever of greater than 39 degrees centigrade, equal to or greater than, and also or, or 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Even as it rash means it comes and goes. It changes day to day. That's about the main description there. Polyarthritis, it can look like rheumatoid. It can have small joints, large joints. It can be symmetric. It can be progressive. It'll stay progressive in some subset of patients. Let's get into the triad symptoms and describe those a little better. Quotidian fever means it rises above 102 Fahrenheit or 39 degrees centigrade and then returns to baseline. It happens once a day. The amazing thing about this condition is it happens at the same time every day. It's never in the morning, 
morning is when you have your highest levels of endogenous cortisol. So it's if you see fever at 7 a.m., you're dealing with infection or malignancy and not Stills disease. It's incredibly rare. The spikes of Stills disease that happen at the same time in every patient every day are usually late at night, 10 to 2 a.m., or late in the afternoon, 4 to 5, or occasionally late in the morning, 11 to 12 in the morning. And then it repeats it again tomorrow. The patients can look at the clock and tell you when it's going to happen. And it happens first with a shaking chill, rigors like you can't imagine. And then they throw off all the covers because they get this high spike and they go up to 104, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and when it starts to come down, they defervesce. So when you see them on morning rounds, they may look normal. They may not look as sick as they were last night. There's a few more examples of the high spiking fever, both from the Bywaters paper and my original case. You can see my original case actually has a high baseline. That's called a remittent pattern, uh, a little less distinctive here, but usually a little sicker patients. When you start to give anti-inflammatory therapy, salicylates, and then later on steroids, you start to see the, the more typical pattern of daily spikes, or going from twice daily spikes to once daily spikes and then going from daily spikes to intermittent spikes or lower, lower, grade, lower grade fever as you start to add in steroids, et cetera. Rash, the evanescent salmon pink rash is also called a rheumatoid rash or the stills rash throughout the literature. Uh, it does change day to day. It does tend to be maximal or most likely to appear during febri febrile uh, time points. Uh, it is a faint uh, erythematous salmon pink in some people. It can be macules and papules that can have confluence. Uh, it really does look like a viral example. It's a viral, morbilliform looking rash. It never happens on the face, never happens on the palms or soles or hands. It is an extensor extremity uh, and truncal and V-neck rash. It can have the associated features of dermatographism and Kebner phenomenon. Kebner phenomenon is, is what you're seeing here on the right. This young man has been scratching his abdomen. So when the rash comes, it comes as isomorphic lesions along the lines of former trauma. And Kebnerization is if you take a pen and you scratch the skin, you get a wheel and flare that takes a long time, an hour or more to go away. Urticaria pruritus is very common. 40% of patients with Stills disease, kids and adults will have urticaria or pruritus that can be intense. This is a common feature amongst the auto-inflammatory syndromes. So don't believe because of this, it can't be Stills disease. As I said, uncommon is rash on the face, palms, soles, dermal plaques, alopecia, enodosum, rainouts has been described, but these are rare. Here's some pictures. This is a um, patient of mine who has a rash almost in a, in a V-neck distribution. She did not have myositis, right? You can see over her right shoulder, she has a wheel and flare of dermatographism where she scratched herself and that's actually I'm sorry, um, it could be Kevinization as well. But again, macular papular. Here's another one, that same man I just showed you, a young adolescent. He has a protuberant abdomen from panomegaly, and he has an, a rash that comes up with fever. Here's a patient of mine with a faint rash over the anterior chest that's more faint red or pinkish. Let's talk about the arthritis, which is true about joint involvement in Stills disease. Oligoarthritis is more common than polyarthritis. Your second choice, sacroiliitis in 10%. Third choice, seropositivity leads to erosive polyarthritis. Fourth, 10% develop an erosive polyarthritis. And five, 50% develop carpal ankylosis. Answer down. The answer is a ha half of patients will develop carpal ankylosis. About a third of patients, 25 to 30, 33%, will develop a chronic polyarthritis that'll look like RA. Right? And, and maybe half of those will be erosive, but we don't have firm numbers on that. Sacroiliitis doesn't happen. Oligoarthritis should make you question the diagnosis. Seropositivity is not part of this con condition. They're supposed to be seronegative by definition. So common features at the outset are arthralgias, myalgias, but they should evolve into arthritis within the first three months. Um, it's usually additive and polyarthritis. The graph on the right, shows you the onset on the left, what happens in the first six months. This is a, taken from the paper that I wrote with Tom Metzger in Pittsburgh on 21 patients. So you can see on the left, 
18 out of 21 had wrist involvement, 14 elbow involvement, 11 shoulder involvement, 11 and 10 with PIP and DIP involvement. And then over time, it settles down in the course after six months to wrist, knees, shoulders, hands, et cetera, right? So it looks like RA. But half the patients will develop what Metzger and Christie described as pericapitate ankylosis of the wrist. So the capitate will fuse to the hamate, to the trapezoid, to the second and third um, uh, metacarpal base, uh, and or to the lunate. And here's an example. This is a patient of the famous Gerald Rodman of scleroderma fame. He saw this man LK in August of 72, normal wrist, although he had wrist pain and wrist swelling. Seven months later, you can see there's evidence of carpal ankylosis where now the capitate is fused to the second and third metacarpal and also to the lunate down here in the bottom right. This is very typical. And again, if you look for it, it takes time in some patients to evolve. It's not usually as aggressive as that particular case. So about two thirds of patients will have sore throat and weight loss and myalgias. Uh, the RES, reticular endothelial system is involved with a paddlesplenomegaly or LFTs, elevation or lymphadenopathy in almost two thirds of patients. Serositis in around 30 to 40% of patients. Uh, I had a patient on the bottom right there on the, who had not only pleuritis, pericarditis, he had myocarditis proven by endomyocardial biopsy. He was 19 with a temperature of 104 and he had splenomegaly and anyway, he also was diagnosed with Stills disease and treated aggressively. The labs are often as distinctive as the clinical um, features. Uh, they, are, they should be seronegative, but they have high white counts. Their hematocrit and hemoglobin drop dramatically. They have very high sed rate CRPs and platelets reflecting the acute phase response. And as they get more and more inflammation, what will happen? Their albumin will drop in response to excessive IL-1, IL-6. Their anemia will become more prominent. Their hemoglobin goes down. And then they'll they lose weight. So the albumin, anemia, and weight loss will all parallel each other in patients who are actively sick with systemic manifestations. Ferritin, which all of you love, is only seen in half the patients. So to hang your hat on a diagnosis on ferritin is a big mistake. Look at the upper right. The distribution of white count is generally 15 to 25,000. Look at the bottom right. The distribution of set rates, 90% have a set rate greater than 50. 50% 50 will have a set rate greater than 90. So again, you can have set rate or CRP or other acute phase reactions, but generally they're all up. Now, ferritin, let's not get carried away. There are other causes for hyperferritinemia. I've seen a lot of hyperferritinemia. I've seen over 200 cases of Stills disease in my career. And I can tell you, I have about 10 or 15 really good, you know, greater than 10,000 ferritins. So I've seen way more ferritin in other diagnoses like lupus and vasculitis. And, but you should consider iron overload cases, uh, intrinsic liver disease, cancer, sepsis, and then what worries me most is when I see extreme ferritins, I'm really looking at the development of macrophage activation syndrome, also called the hemophagocytic syndrome, which is quite common in kids and adults with Stills disease. Just look at the right. This is one series that shows you with active disease, the mean ferritins are around 4,000. With inactive, it goes away. The bottom right shows you 10 kids with um, pediatric or juvenile systemic JA who start out with ferritins generally around 1,000, and then with uh, time, they slowly got better and came down with therapy. You know, the, that on the bottom represents weeks, not days. So the patterns of involvement here, everybody starts out with systemic disease, meaning arthritis uh, is usually not the component that starts here. And by systemic disease, I mean fever, rash, pleuritis, crazy looking labs, et cetera. It goes away and some people never comes back. That's be monosystemic. In our collection of 21 patients in Pittsburgh, four out of 21 had one spike. You can see that two out of the 21 had polysystemic with disease-free intervals. And then in the bottom two graphs, you're seeing uh, either monosystemic or polysystemic disease with chronic arthritis, usually inflammatory arthritis that looks like RA. That's 15 out of the 21 patients. Mortality in stills, there is no mortality in stills. You're not supposed to die from systemic JIA. You're not. If you do, it's because you develop macrophage activation syndrome or because you use too much steroids and killed them with steroids. 
meaning that they got opportunistic infections and died from that. I've seen more deaths than stills disease from like car accidents and unrelated things. I've had a few patients die from amyloidosis and renal amyloidosis. But again, the main complications here are steroid complications, MAS, uh, steroid related infections, DIC and chronic lung disease have been described, but they're not very common. So who can diagnose stills disease? First off, kudos to pediatric rheumatologists. They know what they're doing. They see a lot of these cases. This is not hard for them. They know what to exclude. They know how to manage them. Adults, we don't see quite as many, which means I think you adult rheumatologists should be talking to pediatric rheumatologists about your difficult cases. They can help you tremendously. Most of us adult rheumatologists get these cases handed off to us from infectious disease consultants. Patients admitted to the hospital high fever. There's a big uh, ID workup. When the ID guys are gone and say, nope, no bacterial, no viral, no fungal, no parasitic infections, it must be Stills disease or systemic GIA, call, call the rheumatologist. And if you're a rheumatologist, you can be certain about the diagnosis by knowing the criteria. What are the criteria? Well, let's, before we get into criteria, let me give you my five top mistakes that I've seen. Again, I've seen many, 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 many cases. I've seen a lot of misdiagnosis. The number one mistake that rheumatologists make is making the diagnosis without the presence of the triad, even essent rash, quotidian fever, polyarthritis. This is always included in the criteria. Two, not having a daily quotidian fever or not reaching 102. Patient says, I get a fever every day of 101. Sorry, Charlie, that's not Stills disease. Number three, until you have, they have fevers that come and go. I had it for two weeks, I had it for three days, then it went away, or it comes back every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or it comes back every spring, or it comes back, that's not Stills disease, that's likely another auto-inflammatory disease, usually monogenic, and can be diagnosed with a battery of gene tests that you can get through next-gen sequencing, usually for a reasonable cost. Or emphasis on the ferritin to make the diagnosis. You will miss more than half the cases if this is what you're hanging your hat on. And lastly, using a TNF inhibitor disease that doesn't work where it doesn't work. Meaning TNF inhibitors do well in the patients with still disease who develop chronic arthritis. You're just basically treating RA. But if they have systemic disease and they're being newly diagnosed in the hospital, do not use a TNF inhibitor. They don't work. And I know you can you'll tell me, oh, I, I saw a paper once. Yeah, it was from 15 years ago. I, in the recent ACR guidelines in the treatment of JIA say you can use an IL-1 inhibitor at the outset. First, make a diagnosis. These are my criteria. I came up with them when I was first working on this in 1984. I published this in 2000. You get two points for having what I think are the highly predictive features of the disease, very discriminatory. Um, and if you have 10 points, you're likely to have the diagnosis. Quotidian fever, the stills rash, simultaneous elevation of white count and sed rate, and I have both. And I would accept CRP, uh, white count and CRP, or white count and another acute phase reactant, seronegativity and carpal ankylosis. Now, carpal ankylosis is not present at the outset, but in some, you may be seeing them later in the course. And of course, this would be any time during their course of illness. You get one point for minor features, age less than 35, polyarthritis, sore throat, LFTs or hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy, serocytis and ankylosis somewhere else. There's Yamaguchi criteria that are often talked about. This is from Jay Room. Um, they also rely on a major minor um, motif in making the diagnosis. I don't expect you to know these or write these down, have them in your pocket. All you need to know is a website that I built for you called Stills Now. Sounds like Room Now, but it's Stills Now, as you can see in the upper left. And Stills Now on the first page is gonna say, do you meet criteria? You click on this button, it'll take you to the criteria page. On the website, there are videos that will cover a lot of stuff that I'm talking about here in greater depth. There's a lot of news and journal reports. There is reports and resources for your patients, what to do when it's not Stills disease, best drugs for Stills disease, laboratory diagnosis of Stills disease, et cetera. So again, it's a valuable website, stillsnow.com. If you click on the calculate my risk, you can calculate whether or not you have the diagnosis. And you basically check boxes on symptoms that are present now or at the onset. And the website will tell you whether you meet Cush criteria, Yamaguchi criteria, or ILAR criteria. I think you'll find it useful, stillsnow.com. 
How do I assess activity? Basically, set, set, uh, set rate CRP, white count, and LFTs are what I watch most closely, right? And that's, they'll tell me how active the patient is. Um, if it's, they just have arthritis, it's what you would normally do for RA. But if they have systemic disease, um, the simple things are, work really well. And you can see on the right, in this one study, it showed that more predictive than ferritin, sedrate, and CRP is NLR, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. It's usually quite low, but if it's greater than three, they're very inflamed. If it's greater than 5.86, they're at high risk for macrophage activation syndrome. The other thing I'll tell you here that you'll see nowhere else is highly valuable biomarker is the aldolase. Not CPK, you can do CPK and aldolase, the CPK will be normal, but patients who have an IL-1 driven autoinflammatory disease or Stills disease or systemic JNA, the aldolase will be high when they're active. And you can use that as the biomarker to know whether or not they're in remission or doing well or not. More recently, there's another report about myeloid related protein 8 slash 14, that looks very good, but that's too early to know where that's going to go. How do you treat this? When I asked rheumatologists in a survey of almost 250 rheumatologists, after steroids, what would you use? Half would use a biologic and half would use methotrexate, and they're both right. But again, the recent um, uh, criteria, uh, guidelines from the, the ACR say it's okay to use an IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitor. So everybody should get high-dose steroids. Non-steroidals can be a little bit troublesome in patients who have LFTs. Steroids, um, and, and again, don't be wimping out with 5 milligram, 10 milligram, 20 milligrams. That doesn't work in Stills disease. If it works in your case of Stills disease, it's not Stills disease. Stills disease requires one milligram per kilogram, 60 milligrams a day, rarely 40. And then you need to, if you're gonna use that kind of dose, you need to put them on either methotrexate or an IL-1 inhibitor or IL-6 inhibitor. I like IL-1, short half-life with anakinra of six hours. Uh, I give it at night because your own endogenous IL-1 and IL-6 uh, IL are, are, are circadian cytokines. They come up late at night when you get the fevers. So give the IL-1, which has a short half-life, at night, QHS dosing. Um, and you can use IL-6 as well, but it's a little slower to start, but it will work certainly just as well and maybe even better in patients who have problematic arthritis. There may be a role of uh, calcineurin and, and JAK inhibitors, but it's hard to say. Um, so FDA-approved therapies in the United States for Stills disease in the adult, it's canakinumab only. In Stills in children, it's uh, for canakinumab and tocilizumab. Look at the package insert on that. I'll flash up this slide for you. You can take a picture of it. It'll tell you about the dosing that's used in the different conditions for which it's approved and the half-life of this. Uh, again, I like anakinra because of its short half-life. After a patient has done well on this with QHS dosing, then I may switch over to canakinumab um, at some point. Question is, you don't know how long to treat these patients. You don't know when they're truly in remission. When patients ask me, how long is this going to last? I say either eight months to eight years, and we'll know it when we see it. So show me a year or at least six months of remission, then we can talk about maybe withdrawing therapy. The IL-1 inhibitors do have a higher risk of injection site reactions, 71% supposedly with um, anakinra, 48% uh, with rolonisep. But I want to make the point that when the patient is transitioned from systemic disease to articular disease, you manage them, what, like it says in this blue box, just as you would RA, methotrexate, TNF inhibitors, abatacept, IL-6, combinations, JAKs, they all work incredibly well. The real challenge is treating MAS, macrophage activation syndrome, of which you have several options. MAS can occur in up to 10% of kids and adults, uh, and I would worry about that. Um, we talked about complications earlier, polyarthritis, DIC, carpal ankylosis, lung disease. We don't know what the etiology of the lung disease is, and it's really quite rare. Um, amyloidosis does occur. I've had two patients, as I said, who died with renal amyloidosis with Stills disease. But cytokine storm is the same as, uh, and a cytokine storm being infamous during COVID, is the same as macrophage activation. It's the same as HLH. All these patients have sudden high fever, hypotension, CNS manifestations. They take a turn for the worse. And it's exemplified ex by extreme levels of ferritin and rising, rapidly rising LFTs, AST and ALT more so than ALK-BAS. They develop a pancytopenia. So when they once had a high platelet count and a high white count, 
they are taking a turn for the worse and they're bottoming out if you're not, if you don't catch them soon enough. It has all the same biomarkers as does cytokine syndrome. I want to tell you that again, your uh, the, the hairs on the back of your neck should stand up when you see a patient whose sed rate is dropping when it was once high, whose white count was dropping when it once hot was what once high. And now the CRP and the ferritin are going even higher. Uh-oh, this is macrophage activation. The earlier you make the diagnosis and intervene, even if it's not complete, and there are criteria for this that I don't think are worth your looking up, you should treat if you suspect. By the way, hemophagocytosis on bone marrow is not required for the diagnosis. If this occurs in kids, the mortality is here is up, is up to 20%. In adults, the mortality here has been as high as 38%. What do you do? You start amongst high dose steroids, very high dose steroids, two milligrams per kilogram split doses. Start them on an IL-1 or an IL-6 inhibitor. And if you have access to something to inhibit T cell activity and all these cytokines that are being generation, amapalumab or cyclosporin is what I prefer. The etiology of this is shown on the right. NK cells and dendritic cells under the right circumstances now are activating CD8 cells and you have tons of cytokines being produced. The main one that drives the syndrome is gametaferon. Emipalumab is a gametaferon monoclonal antibody uh, therapy that works incredibly well. But by targeting uh, T cells with cyclosporin or etoposide, you're cutting down on the plethora of cy cytokines that are driving MAS. Let's summarize, stills in kids and adults are the same. It is important that you confirm the diagnosis by finding the triad and looking for the other suggested features. Know the criteria. If you don't know the criteria, know the website, stillsnow.com, and that'll teach you how to make the diagnosis. If they're atypical, at all atypical, then you really have to question the diagnosis. If they don't meet criteria, question the diagnosis, and then start to do gene testing. You know, if you live where FMF is prevalent, test for FMF. Um, it, and, and again, you can make the diagnosis there on the number of days of fever, you know, something like FMF or um, some of the CAP syndromes will have a few days of fever, right? Whereas something like TRAPS will have 10 days to 20 days of fever, and then it will go away. But a gene testing is important. You have to consider besides auto-inflammatory conditions, infection, leukemia, lymphoma. Um, and that's, I think, takes care of most of the cases that get confused with Stills disease. Worry about MAS, use IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitors liberally and tell your patients, this is not something that goes away in a few weeks, eight months to eight years. And luckily some will go into long-term remission. I hope you find this valuable. Um, if we don't get to do questions here, I'd be happy to take your questions by email at jackcush, jackcush at roomnow.com.